Hello, Tom Kosnick, founding member of the Vices Group here with Gary Pierce to talk about the uh, emerging OSHA guidelines and rules concerning COVID-19. Gary, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Let's see. Gary has got 35 plus years in the industry. He was the risk chief risk and compliance officer for Kelly for a number of years and currently is the uh, chief risk architect for the climate. And uh, Gary and I have known each other for a few years now. And uh, this topic I found out about uh, is going to be affecting almost all staffing companies. So Gary, why don't you tell us a little bit about this, uh, this, uh, this new guidelines? Great, be happy to Tom, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, and if I can figure out how to change my page, we'll be, there we go, all right. So OSHA has been kind of in the background for the past several years, but uh, President Biden made it clear during his campaign that OSHA was gonna be a much more prominent issue. And it, it is both an aspect of his um, planned response to the COVID epidemic, but also um, it plays to his base of organized labor and uh, the plaintiff's bar. Uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a political winner and it, it's got a lot of substance to it. So within a day of him taking office, he directed OSHA to uh, put out some uh, voluntary guidance and then to consider a uh, so-called emergency temporary standard. So what an emergency temporary standard does is it bypasses the normal, very, very lengthy um, OSHA rulemaking process. Mm. And... Um, lets the agency issue uh, new rules without a uh, notice and public comment period and without all the other aspects of normal rulemaking. But they can only do that when there is a finding that employees are exposed to a grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards and that an emergency standard is necessary to protect people from that danger. I don't think they'll have any trouble arguing that uh, COVID thereby qualifies. Mm. Uh, moreover, uh, President Biden has made it very, very clear that he wants OSHA to do this. And so you can pretty well take it for granted that before the March 15 deadline that President Biden set down, that there is going to be a new COVID-19 emergency temporary standard. So what this means in practice, Tom, is that Rather than uh, just voluntary guidance, there will be specific new rules that all employers in all states have to follow. OSHA did issue some uh, guidance on January 29, again, which uh, the president asked for. And we'll take a look at that uh, because it's pretty indicative of what I think is going to be in this uh, imminent emergency temporary standard. Now, one other big point here, Tom, is that this emergency temporary standard, because it's an emergency temporary standard, uh, is almost certainly going to take immediate effect on the day it's issued, uh, but it can only run for six months unless they try to turn it into a permanent rule. Uh, I don't think COVID is going to go away in six months, and I think that there will be enough concern about infectious disease that prior efforts to issue a, an infectious disease standard will take root and that this emergency temporary standard will in effect uh, be a new permanent rule. Makes sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm, con I'm curious on how, two things, how, how this is going to affect staffing companies and secondly, what staffing companies need to do to prepare. Yeah, so let's, let's take a step back in that regard. And I'll say this, that um, OSHA cares a whole lot more about, uh, and Democratic Party cares a whole lot more about organized labor and keeping the plaintiff's bar happy than it does about the temporary staffing industry. Um, you know, whether that's good or not isn't for us to worry about, but that's just the way it is. And so um, temporary staffing is not going to get a free pass on this stuff. And any rule that is applicable to a staffing customer uh, is likely to be applied to staffing companies as well. Now, the traditional way that OSHA has worked is that um, employers, you know, the, the customers of the staffing company have been primarily responsible for specific worksite hazards and for compliance. 
and the staffing company has been responsible to make sure that they're putting their workers into a safe environment and that they're getting general safety training. OSHA won't care much about who did what. They'll care that it gets done. And staffing companies will be a convenient political target, I believe. So this is gonna really raise the ante in terms of what staffing companies need to do, not just because of this philosophical underpinning, but because there's gonna be all kinds of new specific rules that give new ways to mess up. And so this is something that staffing companies are gonna to have to pay a lot of attention to, in my opinion. Now, as I said a moment ago, Tom, uh, there was this guidance issued on January 29. And while it is um, just guidance, I think that this solidifies the idea that if you don't meet these sorts of guidance points, that you're raising the risk of getting sued for a uh, lack of uh, uh, diligence, uh, perhaps more so the customers of the staffing company, but not exclusively so. And you can see on the left side of this uh, slide that I have up some of the core elements. And uh, one might look at this and say, well, most people do most of these things already. Uh, but I would ask how well, number one. Number two, are you adapting to all the different circumstances that you might encounter? And three, which is really an acid test, is can you prove you did all this stuff? Hmm. If you can't prove it, uh, there might be a presumption you didn't do it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's gonna be a bad fact if, if OSHA comes knocking on your door. Also take note on the right-hand side of the page, the so-called general duty clause, which I have uh, um, called uh, the generally greater duty clause these days. It's a catch-all that pretty well says that whether there's a specific rule or not, uh, you've gotta do whatever you need to do, dear employer, to make sure that you aren't exposing your people uh, to uh, uh, risk of um, death or serious physical harm. And um, OSHA has this kind of a, um, a jack of all trades rule that they can apply even in the absence of any specific standards. And that's gonna get more attention going forward as well. So I've, I have clients that uh, are large enough where they have a risk management, a personnel risk management department and whatnot. And then I've got clients that have no risk management department. It's kind of done uh, whatever. Uh, so how, how, how do those two different kinds of staffing companies deal with this or respond, respond to this? Yeah, so, so let's talk about the ones without a risk management department. Okay, if, if you're doing IT staffing uh, or primarily home-based work uh, sorts of things, Mm -hmm. realistically, you're not at a whole lot of risk here. Uh, but if you're putting out people into light industrial environments, uh, distribution centers, um, anything of that ilk, uh, you're fully exposed here. And if you don't have enough scale to uh, administer this stuff yourself, well, uh, you're either going to have to heavily collaborate with your customers or uh, find a way to build up some competence and knowledge in this regard. Because when this rule comes out on March 15, as I said, it'll take immediate effect. And yeah, there aren't enough enforcement people to go around, but uh, you can still get sued. And uh, if you have a, a demonstrated failure to meet a, a published OSHA standard, uh, that's gonna raise your liability exposure as well as um, the fact that if the customer gets investigated, you can get dragged into that as well. So it, it, it's, a, it's a new permanent fact of life and yes, it, it really will call for greater scale on the part of those doing uh, light industrial sort of work or manufacturing and distribution, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. What, what, uh, what, what should staffing companies be telling their clients? Uh, how should they be working with their clients on, on this whole topic? Yeah. Well, you know, clients are all over the place. Some of them are going to have uh, very... Um, sophisticated safety operations, others not so much. So I would start with discussion and collaboration. And I would recommend that you have a discussion with uh, your staffing uh, contacts at, at each customer mm. and talk about what we're going to do about this because um, everybody is going to be susceptible and uh, OSHA won't care a whole lot about who did what. 
they won't dig deeply into sorting out whether this was a staffing company obligation or a customer of the staffing company's obligation. They're just gonna to wanna to have proof that it got done. And if it isn't done, they'll probably hold both parties responsible. Even for things that were traditionally the responsibility of the host employer, it seems to me. So you gotta plan out point by point what needs to be done. Can you prove you did it? And are you applying that activity consistently uh, on a day-to-day -day basis across all locations, all operations, and appropriately adapting to the uh, different circumstances that you might see at different work sites. It's a big job. Yeah, and, and who, who again, the, the owner operator type business, middle market folks, I mean, the, the, who, who do they go to for advice or assistance with making any kind of internal adjustments on this? Yeah, so, so let's say that you don't have a whole lot of in-house resources. Couple ways to go. One would be obviously to collaborate with the safety representatives of your customer. Mm -hmm. uh, you might say that the playing field is a little tilted by doing that, but it's a good start. Number two might be your own insurance agent or broker. Most larger agents or brokers have uh, safety staff and whether they render that as part of their core service or as an additional value add, you have to figure out case by case, but they're gonna have ways to bring you resources. But keep in mind that um, just like construction goes through boom and bust phases, this is a boom time for safety people. And with all these new work sites and new employers being susceptible to OSHA rules, there's gonna be a lot of demand for safety uh, services. So uh, you might wanna get your place in line sooner rather than later to try to line up resources. Um, you know, wherever you can find them, there's lots of private consultants out there. Um, uh, risk start, risk management consultants, yeah. yeah. So, so start, start looking around would be my advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, any, anything, uh, gosh, uh, I, I wanted to get this news out, obviously, because, you know, a big, uh, a big chunk of the staffing industry is in that light industrial sector. So this is going to be very uh, important information for them. Yeah, but, and you know uh, what, um, what you see on this page is evidence that, uh, you know, the new OSHA, uh, is going to be a whole lot less friendly to employers. Uh, and I won't read all the points that you can see on this page, but uh, organized labor is likely to have a direct seat at the table. And there is talk, just to show you where this is headed right now, where uh, some uh, kind of leftist leaning organizations are calling on Congress to enable employees or their representatives to directly sue their employers for workplace safety violations. I don't think that's going to happen in the next few months, but it shows you where the political winds are blowing. Yeah. And, and it might play out kind of like EEOC, where you have to start by filing an OSHA complaint and either get some sort of right to sue letter, or you have an ability to sue if OSHA doesn't take up your cause. Uh, but things like whistleblower bounties uh, and expansion of OSHA to uh, 1099 workers or independent contractors and uh, things like that are, are all on the horizon and things I think you're gonna see enacted in time, as well as uh, a doubling of OSHA enforcement personnel and a much less uh, cooperative uh, coaching attitude. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if you're staffing to a prominent customer or one in a politically uh, charged environment, um, OSHA is going to be very aggressive in terms of uh, shooting first and uh, proving that they aimed at the right target later. Uh, public shaming, uh, massive data collection sharing, mm. uh, and um, making that accessible and um, uh, analyzing it in unfavorable ways. These will all be aspects of uh, what will be done in the name of public safety. Mm. So get, get a game plan down on how, you, how, you're gonna, how we're gonna respond. Think it through. Yep. So, I would start by looking at what is likely to be required, what is in the guidance that has been issued is a good indicator of that. Also the, uh, the Virginia temporary standard, which has now been made permanent, you could do a search on that and see the key elements. But what you see on this page are some baseline activities, facility hazard assessments, developing written mitigation plans, enforcing use of appropriate protective equipment, 
physical separation, physical barriers where separation isn't feasible, cleaning protocol. Mm. Uh, it's guaranteed that there'll be a strong emphasis on training in a language and format well understood by the employee. So if you have employees who do not understand English well, you'll probably have to render that training in a language that they better understand. Um, there will be very strong anti-discrimination and anti-retaliation provisions. There will be all kinds of advice uh, to uh, um, uh, have outreach to employees in terms of where they can get tested. There will be encouragement to pay for vaccinations, all that sort of stuff. Um, daily health checks may well be called for. You'll have to cooperate with the government in terms of uh, notification. And if you don't uh, follow the existing OSHA logging rules regarding what COVID events need to go on the OSHA log, you're going to have a problem as well. So it's a big new deal and it isn't going to go away, particularly if you're staffing beyond uh, just home-based or IT, uh, but including things like staffing clinical trials, uh, distribution environments, certainly the entire spectrum of light industrial can be a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I tend to be a, a the glass is, is, is uh, the glass is half full kind of a guy. Uh, but I would, I would assume that, uh, gosh, yeah, when you think about it, you know, with all the vaccines coming out and, uh, oh, we'll have 300, 300 million people vaccinated by the end of June, which I'm starting to hear. Uh, but I mean, the whole thought that these protocols, because you're right, COVID is not going away. I mean, the virus is not going, going away. So my guess is, is that even if we get a good percentage of the population vaccinated, these guidelines are still going to be in place and, uh, and the government is going to be on employers to uh, make sure they're followed. Yeah. And you know what, in that regard, Tom, I think that um, the first point on this slide, that safety is the new must, not a nice to have, mm. is really the residual effect of even if COVID dies down, the, the scars and the pain and the memories will persist. Uh, and that is going to be a permanent new feature of the workforce and of the regulatory environment. Mm. And a whole lot of things really flow out of that. Anything else final that, uh, any final advice you wanna earmark here? Well, I, I, I think some of the things on this page that this is really an episode of trust and that if you want to have an engaged workforce and you want to attract and retain the best people, that ensuring their safety is a new element of that. And I don't think that people will necessarily be resistant to new rules as long as you can communicate why you're doing them and that they demonstrate that they're necessary to keep people safe, that people will, will generally uh, both adhere to that and appreciate it, if not expect it. But you'll never have perfect information you're always going to have to act on the fly. You're always going to have to be able to respond to change circumstances. And at the risk of sounding a little self-serving, it's going to be hard to do all this without appropriate technology so that you can be consistent in your practice, comprehensive, and that you can prove stuff got done and you can have accountability in your own organization. Mm -hmm. A lot of work, a lot of, lot of, lot of more, more, more things to, to uh, think through and figure so, out. Yeah, so by March 15, you're gonna see a rule uh, and uh, maybe we'll talk then about what that means, but uh, I think it's pretty clear what's gonna be in there. Yeah. It's gonna yeah, be a new yeah. permanent fact of life. Hey Gary, thank you so much for uh, bringing this issue, uh, shedding a little bit more light on this issue. Uh, uh, Gary Pierce, uh, Chief Risk Architect at Acclimate, 35 plus years. Uh, of risk and compliance with the National Staffing Company. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, enjoyed it.